Bates getting ready to take off on the warm-up lap now. 50 laps around the circuit here at uh, Calder Park this afternoon for round one of the National Touring Car title. We mentioned before, first time in about uh, six years that Alan Moffat has graced the circuit. Usually uh, gives Calder a wide berth for whatever reasons you can ride into. And uh, today he's going to have a race on his hands, certainly up front in the uh, opening stages of the race. Well, what an important race this is today for Alan Grice. The man with a mission, and the mission is to make people realise he's as good as he truly is. He did it, I think, at Bathurst last year when he became the first person ever to lap the circuit there in a touring car at better than the old 100 miles per hour. But didn't win the race, had to be content with second place to Peter Brock. Today he's fastest in practice, he would dearly love to put his name at the head of the list for the eight races that will count for this year's Australian Touring Car Championship. And he'd like to win the title for the roadways team. The man who holds the title is Dick Johnson, and he has to be content so far with sixth place on the grid in the new Falcon he's campaigning this year. Peter Brock, just up alongside the roadways car, they will start from the second row of the grid and have one of the two Nissan turbos, the Bluebirds, alongside him. Just how the turbos get off the line remains to be seen. They don't quite have the same torque as the big V8s when they start, but George Fury in car 55 is right behind Alan Moffat in 43. He'll be happy about that. Two V8s behind each other and the rotary and the turbo one after the other, and they both share, some, share somewhat similar torque characteristics, so they should be fairly well compatible on the grid. But George Fury has right behind him car number 17, which is Dick Johnson, and he won't be too happy about that. Peter Brock, the man to watch in the middle of your screen on the second row, the green flag goes, and oh, Brian Grice has a great start, and so did George Fury in the out. turbo. Out he the really outside. wound it up, and look at him go up in the second spot, going for the lead, going to try and dive down inside, won't quite make it. Peter Brock's going well, a puff of brake, he locks a brake there, Brock on the outside, goes wide, hits the gravel, and Brock is out wide, he's regained the track. I don't know if he can, he's right out hard against the wall there, and still trying to come back in. Had a locking brake which put him wide, had the sense to back off and hold that slippery line. Got through it, but he's lost a lot of places and Brock is back in about 10th or 12th place. You can see him there in the middle of the field. It's Grice up in the lead. Johnson doing very well up into third place, contesting with Moffat. George Fury's in second spot in the turbocharged Bluebird. And Fury really is flying. I wouldn't have expected he could have got away from the start so quickly. Pretty obviously, Nissan had done a lot of homework over Christmas and really got the turbo flying. Alan Moffat is in third spot. Dick Johnson in fourth place, but Alan Grice leads the race at the end of the first of 50 laps. One lap to complete it, and a good scrap going on between Dick Johnson and Alan Moffat. They fight for racing room. Johnson said, my line on the inside, Alan. And coming up on the inside of him, too, is Warren Cullen as they work the back straight away. Here's Moffat. Coming up quickly on the outside of Moffat is Steve uh, Masterton, and before him, Warren Cullen. So Moffat in the traffic uh, here in the opening laps of uh, this race after missing the start. And Bryce, though, is the leader. And Brock is in 10th place. They have to fight back hard and work the Commodore hard to come from 10th back to get on even terms with uh, these early runaways. Brock had a break, uh, had a break lock up on that first lap, went wide, controlled the car, but lost a lot of places. Picked up a few, but he's in 10th place. And that's good news for Alan Grice, who has a big lead at the moment. Second lap gone. Back across the strike. At this time, it's Dick Johnson working away on the inside of George Fury, going up into Valvoline corner. Fury still holds second. Johnson into third place. Alan Moffat's in fourth, and it's the uh, Bluebird show that it certainly has the legs to match the big uh, Falcon V8, and he's breaking later because of the lighter weight. So that's uh, an interesting trend already with this little turbo, turbo Bluebird right up there in second place and ahead of the big oh. VH in the early stages of the race. A bit of a wiggle as they go through the SSR. I don't know where George Fury went that time. We'll have to check that, see if he comes back onto the straightaway trailing the leader, because he really had it around sideways. Yes, he's still, in. still in second place. He's just through the car. It's his old rally instincts, I suppose. <laughs> but just watch the speed of these cars. There he is in second spot. Now, you would expect the big V8... Look at Brock Johnson come back behind him. Live. Yes, Brock making a big move. We'll just catch up with him in a moment. But obviously, Dick Johnson can't catch the four-cylinder turbo. I'll tell you what, though, going back to 10th place, here's Brock, and he is storming back through the field. Look at Moffat in front of him. He's picked up five places in one lap, Mike. He's up into fifth place now, alongside his old rival, Alan Moffat, on the outside. He'll try and take him through the S's, or on the way out through the straight. And that is sensational driving by Peter Brock. Oh, look at the traffic in there. They go snaking through the S's. 
Got a good race going here for round one of the touring car title with Alan Grice and the STP oil treatment Commodore, the race leader George Fury. This and Turbo in second place, third place being held down by Dick Johnson, fourth to Alan Moffat in the Stuyvesant, and then moving up on the outside of Moffat is Peter Rock coming from tenth back to fifth. Moffat taking a very inside line there as they follow the lead through. Grice goes through, taking a good line. Then it's uh, the Bluebird of Fury. Then it's Dick Johnson, Moffat, Brock. Back to Warren Cullen, but the leading five are all pretty familiar names, with the exception of George Fury, who's something of a newcomer. But Moffat there weaving around, trying to find a way up on the outside of Dick Johnson. Would like to get past him. Reckons he's quicker through there. And would like to get past the big V8. Puts his nose up on the outside. Decides it wouldn't be wise to stay there and gets behind him. But we'll try and get a very fast line through Glow Weave. Get on the inside and maybe just tuck in behind him. I don't think he'll outdrag him, but he'd like to get a bit of aerodynamic assistance down the straight and probably outbreak him towards the end. You can fix him off it. Pull in behind a little bit, as he's doing now, and then pull out maybe after another couple of hundred metres. He'll go deeper under brakes. There he goes up on the right-hand side. Try going on the inside of Johnson. He's got him. And Moffat goes through into third place. Johnson fourth. Peter Brock still in fifth place as they work the back straight, heading down to General Credits, the right-hander. Brock a little out in the marbles there, but now he uh, zeroes in on the tail of uh, Dick Johnson. Johnson the makes race. Brock. Oh, he's oh, gone. He's he's slid away. He held it very well, but he's gone wide. That's Grice gone wide. Will he get to the fence? No, he won't. You saw him go wide, control it in a masterful fashion. He'll be furious with himself for that. Just a slight bit of mistiming or some problem with the car. Gets back on the track again. He's back in the race, but behind Grice. So now it's George Fury who leads the race. And who would have believed that? But look at the challenge on Fury from Moffat. Side by side, they're going to go down the straight. There's uh, Brock in fourth place. Fury, though, still has the legs on Moffat, but Moffat is winding his little rotary Mazda up. He'll be in second spot. He weaves across the track to get the fast line through the corner. Fury has been seduced into going on the inside, and there'll be Moffat will come out faster. Now it's Brock in third place, having got by Johnson down the straight. So it's Fury, Moffat, Brock and Johnson. They come down the back straight now. Moffat to the outside, Brock uh, getting getting uh, very, very close indeed to uh, Moffat's car. Steve There's Harrington and the other STP car. Yes, and he's been uh, passed here by some of the slower cars, or he regains momentum again and gets underway. We'll concentrate on the, the race lead dice. It's a boomer up front with George Fury, and here they come again, and look at Brock. He's right up now close to the back of uh, Alan Moffat's Mazda. George Fury working to the outside on one of these slower cars as they go to Valvoline Corner again at the end of the front straight. So it's George Fury who leads the first round of the 1983 Australian Touring Car Championship. The cattle farmer from down Albury Way drives a school bus when it's his turn. Was Australian Rally Champion. Decided to go racing and look, look who he's leading. He's leading Alan Moffat. He's leading Peter Brock. He's leading Dick Johnson. <laughs> and Moffat is doing everything except going through the boot. Fairs, please. Coming out of 3DB now into uh, low weave and again George Fury putting on a, a great fight here he's got a ton of pressure on his shoulders with Alan Moffat using all of the racetrack Moffat trying to keep the engine wound up tight as he comes down the front straight away and will pull to the inside or maybe almost at the critical moment on the entry to Valvoline here he goes now on the inside and Brock just sitting back a couple of meters off them Grice going into the pits with smoke pouring out of the tail of the car once again the little Nissan Turbo with all that grunt as it gets onto the back straight away Alan Moffat is all over it like uh, a towel at this stage. They go down the back straight. I don't think Moffat will force uh, Fury into an error. He's a very cool customer. He knows which part of the road is his, and he's forcing Moffat to take the hard lines, and that's quite legitimate. Oh. That's Grice up in the top right corner in the pits, as you can see. Bonnet up. Mechanics working furiously. Whatever it was, they think they've got it uh, fixed pretty quick. No, the car is actually pouring oil out oh, the exhaust yes, pipe. I don't think they've got it fixed. I think they might be going to throw their hat in the air in a minute. Couple of cans of this team, Coming down the front straight away again. Here's this great scrap. And look at Brock on the outside of Alan Moffat and roaming up now on the tail of George Fury. Got a three-way dice going for the lead in the touring car title. Moffat's not going to give up, though. There's Peter Beninka on the outside of the Alfa Romeo getting a great view of three of the superstars of Australian motor racing sweeping by. Brock's in second spot. Now he's going for the lead. That's a miraculous recovery. He was in 10th place at the end of lap one. He's alongside. He's got the lead. He will get Fury now. He'll go and he'll break just as late as George. There's no doubt about it. He'll put the tail of the car around. He's going wide there. Fury tries the line, but Brock's in front. <laughs> Brock's in front. Fury back again. Look for the inside take coming out of the corner. And Brock has roamed up from position 10, sat behind them, passed them, and we'll see if he can run away from them. In 10 laps. In 10 laps. Well, boys, that's the start of the season. Well, <laughs> George Fury's having a go at him. That, that turbo in the uh, Nissan Bluebird has tons of poke. 
But Peter Brock is showing him that the old five litre V8 has got a little bit more and he just makes just that few extra centimetres. There's no more than that in it. George Dewey's hanging on and right behind him is Alan Moffat. The trap between those two is going to be a gem through this race. Here's Moffat again on the inside of Fury coming down to 3 b turn. John White in the Gemini about to be passed and this will be interesting. They're now at the very critical phase of the race where the top runners are passing some of these smaller cars who won't be expecting to be lapped so early and they'll really have to have their eyes in the mirror and give room and the course of the race could well be changed by the way these drivers go past some of the slower cars. Here's now White being passed by Moffat who's got by Fury in the traffic so Moffat's up to second and Fury had to go back to third because of the manoeuvres through the traffic and now it's Brock, Moffat and Fury. Johnson further back. Moffat on the outside of one of the slower cars as they move now onto the back straight here at Calder. He won't be happy with Brian Parmenter who didn't have much choice. He was there when uh, Moffat came up, had to stick on the inside line. Made Moffat go the hard way around. George Fury was reminded. He, the more difficulty that Alan Moffat faces, the happier George Fury's going to be. There's Peter Brock pulling away, maybe a metre lap, no more than that. Alan Moffat knows he can't afford to let Brock get away, which is why he made that manoeuvre on Fury through the traffic, got by him, and now he's after the leader of the race. The form that Moffat's shown in races over the last year has been that he's a strong finisher in this Rotary Master. He'd be placed back a little bit in the field in the early lap, comes on strong at the finish, and he's hoping to repeat that sort of form here today. Well, John Shepherd, you've been a little on the quiet side. What do you think about the first 10 laps of the race? I think it's about what we've learned to expect of the first 10 laps, Mike. I'm interested to watch the antics of Moffat and also Fury jumping out of the slipstream because I'm told over in the pits that they're both very concerned about underbonnet temperature in these cars. So, in and fact, they've got to stay out in the open air and try and keep the temperatures down by forcing air through the radio. Yeah, and what looks like passing moves may not be. In fact, it might just be an attempt to get some cool air in there. But uh, things are panning out pretty much the way we all expected from the times we saw in the, the warm-up session this morning and so forth. Brock was quickest then and... Uh, uh, well, there they go, down into Valvoline Corner, race order. Still Peter Bock leading in the Marlborough Holden Dealer Team Commodore. Second place held down by Alan Moffat and third place held by George Fury in this remarkable Nissan Turbo. Although this business computer can perform very complex tasks, operating it is almost child's play, because it's made by digital. They make advanced business computers with simple designs that are simple to operate, and they come complete with a 12-month warranty. You don't need to be a computer expert to get the best from digital's business computers. You simply need to be in business. Digital. So easy to work with. The Manson car goes around sideways as the first round of the National Touring Car Championship continues here at Melbourne International Raceway. Peter Brock, still the race leader, driving for the Marlborough Holden dealer team in the Commodore number 05. Second place being held down by Alan Moffat in the Peter Stuyvesant Mazda RX 743. And third place, of course, to George Fury in the Nissan Turbo. Alan Grice looks like he could have been an early casualty from the race. Let's check out the action for the pits and Gary Wilkinson. Never thought I'd see the day when Alan Grice couldn't take the pace. What's happened? <laughs> well, uh, we got, obviously got away pretty well, and uh, I think we are pulling away from George and the other blokes about three or four tenths a lap, and, uh, you know, I was braking conservatively and uh, keeping the car straight and looking after it because it's terribly hot. And uh, suddenly in the back braking area uh, at the end of the back straight, as soon as I lifted off the power, uh, there was a, a lot of oil flew up from the crack in the bonnet, onto the screen and also onto my tyres and I had the half a lose and uh, from that point on it wasn't going to get any better. Yeah, well but what it's shown you so far must give you a great hope for the season ahead. Yeah, I think it's a great credit uh, to the blokes that built the car. Um, it's, uh, the car is four days old today, it turned a well on Thursday for the first time so it's obviously, uh, it's obviously a fair bit uh, away from its best. And uh, maybe these guys are going to be in plenty of trouble when it's uh, at its best because uh, you know, I think we can do the times. I think the motor car is very well built and uh, we've just got to keep, keep it together. But it's, as I said, because it's new, there are little things that will niggle us for that. Yeah. What are these guys experiencing out there today in this heat? Well, it's very hot, but it seems as though it's uh, turned a bit cooler. Uh, a bit of a cool change. It's, 
certainly uh, you can see the turbo uh, dropping back. Uh, he was right on the pace initially, but it's obviously the heat getting to him. He's having to knock his revs off because of the uh, the turbo putting the, the heat into the extra heat into the heat into the engine. Also, I think uh, Moffat's got to be very careful to keep out of slipstreams. Uh, for that reason, uh, at this point of the race, he's probably not trying to get as close to Brock as he can, although he seems to have slipped a little further behind. The Brock is certainly looking good. OK, Gracie, sit back and enjoy the view. OK, we'll get some more pistons and some more valves and uh, we'll be sand out. Thanks a lot. Back to you, Mike. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, Alan Grice, climbing from his car and granting that rather <laughs> remarkable interview. Alan Grice really seems to enjoy his, uh, his motor racing these days. He did team, he was with Alan Brown last year, now he's with the STP Radways team. He seems such a happy and relaxed character. It's a totally new uh, Alan Grice that we're seeing. While we were talking to him, we saw Peter Brock past Fred Gibson in the second of the turbocharged Nissan Bluebirds, who's running in 13th place. There are only 12 cars now uh, on the same lap. And they have covered a distance of 19 laps. Gibson had problems before the start of the race. Uh, he was uh, he was in uh, strife as the lights turned to green, and also the Masterton team were having some problems with their car as well. Here's uh, Alan Moffat just coming up to lap Fred Gibson as well. As you can see, the, the track is so short that it's relatively easy to lap another, another car. You only have to uh, pick up about 40 seconds on him and you're ready to lap him again. And it's three of them side by side with Moffat doing it the hard way and going very deep into the S's. Holding it all together though well, coming round towards Glow Weave. He can't afford to let Peter Brock get too far away from him because he takes pressure off Brock and Brock's going to cruise home and Moffat realises that he at the moment poses the greatest challenge. Just behind them, we have uh, well, the leader is Peter Brock, then Alan Moffat, then it's George Fury in the, the Bluebird Turbo, then it's Dick Johnson in fourth place. Car number 16 is next, which is Gary Rogers in the Commodore. He is running in fifth position, and in sixth place, it's Murray Carter in the second of the Falcons. So good news for Murray Carter fans, he's well up in contention. Is Alan Moffat going down the back straight. Dick Johnson coming into the pits in uh, car number 17. Not a good start to the uh, national title defence for Dick Johnson. Moves in our cameras uh, close to the action. The Sevens motorsport cameras always are and always will be. Here's the time on the pit stop on the corner of your screen. A critical stop there. The puzzle mechanic asked him what was wrong. He gave me the answer. Something under the bonnet. They're checking. They're dousing water over the radio, so I'd say the temperature gauge is off the clock in the forward. Dick Johnson has uh, great mechanical feeling for cars, as we see Moffat there passing another of the RX-7s, that's the Ken Hastings car. He tucks in behind, we're watching the work on Johnson's car. Dick builds the car himself, so he knows what goes into it. He watches the gauge, he's like a, a loving parent listening to a child cry at night. Moffat still weaving his way through the field, a tricky part of the race. Oh, oh, that's a tricky sort of manoeuvre too. He wants to get by as quickly as he can. He's not be held up by anyone. And Look he, really good on the tyres. Andrew Manson, yes, he really put the car. Actually, speaking of tyres, Mike, it's rather interesting. The Holden dealer team started on an old set of tyres today, what they call old. They're historically people strap a new set of tyres on and uh, because they're usually faster but the dealer team elected to run with some tyres that had done 20 laps because they felt they'd be more stable and wouldn't go off in this heat and it'll be interesting to see I uh, see what their gamble has done for them because I notice Moffat isn't in fact dropping away the gap is remaining pretty constant in that and if anything he's catching him a tense here or there tyres were a very critical part of the uh, combination here and they were controversial last year where a number of drivers, particularly the big Falcons, were claiming they wanted to have the rules changed so they go to wider wheels and allow wider tyres. They were pointing out that relatively light cars like Alan Moffat's Rotary Mazda RX-7 are allowed to run the same width tyres as the big Falcons and Commodores and not so critical with Commodore but certainly crucial for a heavier car like Falcon and they felt this was giving a, an unfair advantage to Alan Moffat. The width of the, the tyres in his car there, the same as Dick Johnson's Falcon, which means that the big Falcon tyres aren't putting the same sort of correct profile on the, on the wheel. In the meantime, down to the pits and Gary Wilkinson. Thanks very much, Evan. Dick Johnson, you don't look like you're going any further, mate. No, well, I possibly could, Gary, but the, the thing is that uh, I don't want to destroy an engine. It's just getting far too hot and uh, I haven't got the money to go throwing around blowing engines left, right and centre, so... Uh, it's better to save it, I think, because it's a very good engine. And uh, 
it's obvious that the radiators just not good enough on a day like today. Before the meeting, Dick, you felt that you were going to be a half a yard behind some of the other cars, but by gee, you were right in there mixing it with them. Well, to be quite honest, I think I could have stuck with them if it hadn't started overheating. I dropped back to from using 8,000, I went back to 6,5 and, and sort of still half hung in there, so it's, I think it's just a matter of sorting out the heating problem, which we've never ever had before, and uh, it is an extremely hot day, and we'll see what happens on a circuit that suits it a little more than this. OK, Dick, bad luck. Back to you, Evan. Thank you very much, Gary. 8,000 revs, John Shepard, in the Falcon. That's a lot for a big Ford V8, 5.8 litres. Yeah, I never used to cease to be amazed when I was in the dealer team. They used to be saying things like 8,000 revs, and we were struggling to run the Holdens to 6,500 or 7,000 revs, and I thought, boy, they're brave. <laughs> Interesting to see Brock pull out. He's about another second in the gap. It's 3.5 seconds now, so he's gradually pulling away. Yes. What would be the rev limit on a standard motor? Ah, uh, I would think around the 5,000 rev mark. Yes, uh, yeah. Holdens. A standard road going hold and tends to peak out at about 5.52 five, and I would imagine the same thing would apply to the Ford. Um, and it's usually valves that stop them revving any higher than that valve springs, they valve crash at that speed. Uh, mechanically they'd probably stand the drama because a lot of the things that get done to them, uh, mechanically they don't change too much in the bottom end but as, as they start getting up in that 8,000 rev number they're now talking about, <laughs> they have to change everything obviously. John, the point that you made about uh, the dealer team starting on, uh, say, tyres with uh, 20 laps on them, do you think that may have even helped Brock a little bit when he got out in the marbles and all the rocks out there and was able to come back on again and still pick the pace up without any damage? More than likely, I'd say, Mike, because you get out there with some fresh sticky tyres, they would have picked up all the stones, and I guess that's what you're getting at, they would have punctured and so forth, so uh, um, I would say it was a wise decision with that's the benefit of hindsight. OK, halfway through the race, let's take a look. Out there in front and leading for the Marlborough Holden dealer team. Peter Brock, 0.5, 2.5 seconds. The gap over Alan Moffat in the Stuyvesant Mazda, number 43. George Fury in the Nissan Turbo, 2.5 back. Murray Carter, to see him up and running in the top six. He's running fifth at the moment in the Ford. Fourth pl uh, sixth place being held down by Gary Rogers. Fifth place, rather, by Gary Rogers in the recar entry. And Warren Cullen and another Commodore in sixth place. So the Commodores at this stage looking pretty good. And a whole mixture of engines there amongst those leading cars. You've got the leader, Peter Brock, with a 5-litre V8. In second place, Alan Moffat with the peripheral ported rotary engine. I don't quite know how you fairly rate the capacity of it. Under racing regulations, though, they say, well, let's call it above 3-litre car. It's only a tiny motor. But it's built with such a total difference of uh, mechanical features that you can't really compare the capacity to a conventional reciprocating motor. So you've got a V8. Uh, to a, um, a rotary and this car, the turbocharged Herbert, engine capacity 1.8 litres, but turbocharged, which means that the incoming air and fuel mixture is forced in by a turbocharger or a pump that is driven by the exhaust gases. That's why it gets so hot. They have a, a device there, a turbocharger, which spins at uh, somewhere around 100,000 revs per minute, I suppose with the force of the exhaust gases flowing over one fan and it spins another fan which thrusts air and fuel mixer into the engine. So it's a force-fed motor, only one point litres in engine capacity. But boy, oh boy, does it go. And if you've been following uh, motor racing generally, you know that the Formula One cars really are the more powerful ones these days, are the one and a half litre turbos like the Renaults and the Ferraris and the BMW Brabham's that really have the power. So turbocharging in racing seems to be the way of the future. Whether it will apply in touring cars is still a point that many people will debate. It's a lot simpler to build a big strong V8 than to build a turbocharged 1.8 litre car, but as many of the world's manufacturers are going towards turbocharging, we can expect to see more turbos in the future. The people who oh, pioneered it, though, whoops, like Vincent good. Brown, I think, going off at the top end. Yes, the pioneers, though, as Clive does an interesting sort of manoeuvre, uh, the Nissan team and George Fury, the leading driver, just slips through. There's a whole screen of smoke there from someone who just preceded him. Whoopsie, whoopsie, do. Well, uh, could be exit time for Peter Brock. He's, that's the smoke, Peter Brock. We saw smoke Benny's there. Penny. Peter Brock has stopped. A wave of the hand to say, that's it, fellas, I've had it. So Brock is out, the leader is gone, at least Moffat in front from Fury. A service car comes over. Something happened. Same problem as, as uh, occurred with Dick Johnson, we wonder. He's going to the bonnet. If we have the uh, officials, oh, that's better. If you've got another camera, don't bother moving trucks. He just lifts the plate that guides air to the carburetor to see what's happened. It's certainly a motor problem. 
I wonder if it was involved with this car, whether something happened, but I think not. I think it's just something that's occurred mechanically to the car, whatever it is. Peter Brock certainly is out of contention. He's closing the motor. I don't think he's going to go back in the seat and drive it. He hasn't bothered to reclip it. He's taking the long walk towards Gary Wilkinson. Exit Peter Brock after looking strong and in no danger whatsoever. In the meantime, Alan Moffat trying to shake off Stephen Harrington. Trying to put a lap on Harrington as he speeds through now, inheriting the lead in the um, Peter Stuyvesant Mazda RX-7, number 43. A long walk back to the pits, though, for Peter Brock through the sand dunes there at uh, Calder. As you see, too, uh, Moffat is using the right-hand drive Mazda here this weekend. He's, it's the car that uh, Cesario and Hansford smashed up, or not Hansford, <laughs> drove at Bathurst, and uh, they've resurrected it because they reckon it's a better thing to have the driver on the right-hand side here for better weight distribution. And, uh, yes, because the driver sits on the inside of most of the corners, and therefore they go better. Like Peter Manton used to run a left-hand drive mini at uh, Sandown Park years ago. Stephen Harrington uh, is not being shaken off. The young driver from Tasmania determined to show Moffat that he has a bit of talent. Moffat wouldn't be happy with the closeness of Harrington. Can't do much about it. It's a motor race and you're supposed to go as fast as you can. But Harrington has been hanging on to him for lap after lap and really displaying good form. He's one of the bright young stars in Australian motor racing. Driving the second of the roadways cars. I bet that Alan Grice must have across with some envy as Steve Marston comes into the pits. He says, well, I wish I had the sort of reliability that your motor has at the moment. So it's Moffat in front now in this race. Let's see what the positions are as the, the race draws towards the um, 35 lap mark. Moffat in front, in the Mazda. So hot it smokes. Uh, that's that same smoke we saw in the pits at Sandown and I've since found out that the brake scoops are very close to the air, that the air scoops that take the air into the brakes catch fire. Um, it's a quick work by the marshals there, John. Peter Brock wasn't aware of it. He was walking away, not knowing his car's on fire. The marshals saw it, raced up. That could have uh, could have ended up in a pretty nasty situation. I don't know that it would do any more damage than just burn the scoop, but I think it wouldn't have done the brake just a world of good then. imported front-wheel drive Pulsar, Australia's most exciting new small car, with more interior room, headroom, legroom, luggage room, and aerodynamic styling. See Australia's most exciting new small car at your Nissan Datsun dealer. New here at uh, Calder and the first round of the Australian Touring Car Championship continues. Alan Moffat is the race leader picking up the lead after uh, Peter Brock dropped out in the Marlborough Commodore with uh, problems down there and let's go trackside now to Gary Wilkinson. Thanks for it. Thank you very much Mike Raymond. Yes he's not the only one with problems. Steve Masterton uh, looks pretty extensive. Steve what's the problem? This is a, the hottest race I've ever driven in. It's about 50 degrees in the cab here, and it just appears as though the electrical system's chucked it in. Well, you've got plenty of horsepower, but uh, it's not much good if it won't go. That's about the story, I think. Bad luck, Steve. I guess there are a few others having the same problems out there, Mike. The heat is fierce, although, as Dick Johnson uh, did observe, or uh, was it Alan Grice, it is starting to get a little cooler, and that's certainly going to help uh, the runners that are out in front. Back to you. Thank you, Gary. Would have been a little easier if it had been cooler when the program started today, perhaps at one o'clock. Well, the experience of Alan Moffat really counting now and nursing his car around. I'm not suggesting anything's wrong with it, but he knows how to look after a car. The lightweight of the Mazda would be a great help. It's a very reliable car. He extols his virtues constantly, and it seems to be an ideal sort of combination of today's race. George Fury behind doing a great job. And he's got 6.9 seconds behind him in the turbocharged Bluebird. A very hot car because of the very nature of its engine. So George who is no stranger to nursing cars, is doing a great job as well of keeping it going. And look at Murray Carter, the old veteran from Victoria, way up there in third place. He's 26 seconds behind the leader, but that's a great place, and carrying the Ford flag proudly, as he has done on so many occasions. Gary Rogers behind him, the leading Commodore driver, and then a host of others fairly close behind. I noticed uh, Steve Harrington's pulled away from the back of Moffat. I would imagine there would have been a fair few hand wavings going on from Moffat, which I think is all fair stuff, and it's... Uh uh, he's, he's not harassing him anymore, and that's uh, the way it ought to be. Well, they've resolved that. One of the two uh, missiles comes up, of course, number 55, that's running strongly in this. 
George, George Fury. Yes, he'll be looking at lapping uh, Harrington himself fairly soon, and he might have an entertaining time trying to get by. And George, give it just another armful of correction. Yes, well, George is a rally driver by uh, by training, uh, an excellent one too, uh, absolutely, absolutely top level in terms of international standards. Drove for the Nissan team in Australian and some overseas events. A most experienced driver. I'd love to see a race, you know, which is suddenly uh, snow to see how some of these rally fellows would go. I think it'd be sensational on the ice. <laughs> well, here he is moving up on one of the uh, Capris to put a lap on him. Reminds me of the first time Colin Bond tried Formula 5000 cars. It rained at Warwick Farm and he was 17 seconds faster than anyone else in practice. <laughs> in the meantime, down in the pits, it's Gary Wilkinson. Thank you, Evan. Well, for somebody who's not supposed to be uh, interviewing car race drivers, I'm doing a lot of that today, working overtime, Brock. Yes, I've got no complaints about interviewing racing car drivers. Don't worry about that. Hey, listen, what happened? Uh, I think the gearbox must have split because uh, it was still moving and the engine was still sort of running. Uh, everything was running very hot, of course, having to extend the car to get by earlier on and keep the pressure on because it seemed as if Moffat and I were doing fairly uh, even sort of times. That's uh, an unusual thing to occur, but uh, that's my race. At the start of the race, I mean, it was a sensational effort. I think you dropped back to 10th place with that spin-off. Uh, I back spin. Well, not I spin. You slid. You yeah. slid. Um, from 10th place back to 1st place in 10 laps. Now, what does that say about the opposition? Uh, well, then, the problem is that our cars are very, very fast over 10 or 15 laps. We've got no doubts about that. But, of course, it's the ability to keep going. And uh, one of the problems I was signalling to my fellows later on there is that uh, I was having trouble with the rear tyres uh, overheating and I was slipping down for actually lap times, trying very carefully to get out of the corner set, loading up the left-hand rear tyre. But it was... A, I, well, I, I think I could have held an off, but it would have been touch and go, that's for sure. Well, how do you assess what's going on out in the track now? Well, I suppose at the moment now it's, uh, to a certain extent, some working wounded. I, a lot of the cars are braking very, very early. Just watching now, they're putting the brakes on at uh, perhaps a 200-yard marker, whereas normally you'd be going to about 140 yards. Uh, tires would be very hot, and uh, there's also a small bit of smoke drifting out of a few cars, and it probably was drifting out of mine too, because my temperature was absolutely off the clock on the third lap, and I thought, well, <laughs> it's a touring car championship race. You've got to go for it. OK, Rocky, thanks a lot. Evan Green, all yours. Thank you very much, Gary. We're now watching George Fury in second place in the... Turbo Bluebird. George, just within viewing distance of Alan Moffat, who's leading the race in his Mazda RX-7. Doesn't seem able to do too much about it at the moment. They have another eight laps to go, or seven and a half at this point. Been a great drive by George Fury. He's still almost a novice racing driver, and he in, what, his third season of serious motor racing. He, he looks like the sort of fellow who would go into a phone booth to get his uh, racing driving gear on because he, he makes a superman change from the mild man of the spectacle bus driver and cattle farmer to the sort of fellow who mixes it with Alan Moffat and Peter Brock and Vic Johnson and all the other hotshots of the Australian touring car scene. Moffat passing Warren Cullen there and lapping him and the RX-7 putting him one lap ahead of the man who's running in about uh, seventh place, I think, with the uh, cover fifth place. So only four cars now unlapped. The leaders are Moffat in the RX-7, the man we're watching, George Fury in the Bluebird, Murray Carter in the Falcon, in car number 18, we must see him in just a moment, and Gary Rogers in 16, Warren Cullen in 22, two Commodores there in, fifth and, in fourth and fifth place, and Stephen Harrington, who was engaging in that entertaining duel with uh, Alan Moffat some time ago in another Commodore, is in sixth place. So three Commodores for top six, but they're in the wrong places there, fourth, fifth and sixth. There's Murray Carter, what can you say about this man? He raced in the first ever Armstrong 500 at uh, Phillip Island, which preceded the James Hardy 1000, and that's 23 years ago. And he wasn't a young fellow then. And I think he used the helmet, and he still is. He just loves his motor racing. He's remained loyal to his mark like few drivers do. He's always been a Ford man, stayed with them through thick and thin, when sponsorship was lean, when his fortunes weren't high, he stuck with them. He loved his motor racing, he loves Fords, and the people love to see him. He's done a great Five job. laps to go. He's done a great job here today, Murray Carter. And being able to judge the pace uh, hasn't extended the car, and he's still there at the finish, which is a lot more than a few others are. Beautifully painted, too. It's a very well presented car that he's brought on the board today, and that really is a great looking machine that Murray Carter is driving in third place. He has five laps to go. The leader's now about four and a half. Murray Carter, we're watching in the John Sands entry. Still holding down third place, as Evan mentioned. Fury in second, and the race leader, of course, Alan Moffat 
in the Stuyvesant Mazda. Well, we're up into the nervous last few laps now, and the people in the Mazda pits, the Peter Stuyvesant pits for Alan Moffat, must be getting very twitchy. The same as the Nissan team, I'm sure that Howard Mars and his crew, with four laps to go, will be quite content with the second place. They've proved their point, and they're just hoping that everything lasts well, but George will keep it going. Exactly the same as the people in Alan Moffat's pit will be feeling. Been a great race, up among the leaders from the start of this. He was picked off by Brock on his progress through the field, but then a few of them started to fall out. First, Alan Grice, when he had either a piston or a valve to go, something to put his car out. And then Peter Brock, when comfortably in the lead with what appears to be a gearbox problem with a gearbox split, he'd retired, and now here he is in the lead, Alan Moffat, determined to take his first Australian Touring Car Championship for Mazda. And you can't start in a better way than to win the first race. The series goes right through to July. There are eight races in all. And Alan Moffat leading. Five laps to go there, as you can see. That score, but in actual fact, only three on the road. Now, he has covered 47. That's how he was after 45 laps. The conditions have to change. It's still Mazda, Nissan, Ford, Commodore, Commodore, Commodore. Just watching him and Moffat's car, normally he has a piece of convoluted hose sticking out the window to blow air in his face, and I thought, oh, he's, he hasn't done that anymore, but you'll notice he's got a Perspex quarter piece in the window, and he's got a little duct on the top of that, which is blowing air at him, which is probably a lot more efficient as far as blowing air in his face, and also less aerodynamically rotten. Is that for a technical term? Oh, very, very technical, good. not bad. We'll get you to write that down and explain it to us later on. He may have had some sort of wind puddle assistance, I don't know. I'm sure Alan would like to get to a wind puddle. Two laps to go. Two laps to go for Alan Moffat to win the first round of the Australian Touring Car Championship. It's been a great drive. He hasn't done anything wrong at all. He's dodged heavy traffic. He's been very fast. He hasn't wasted a fraction of a second in getting by cars in his pursuit of the early leaders. And when they fell out, he found himself in the lead opened up a gap between himself and George Fury, who went so well in those opening laps. And here he is now with less than a lap and a half to go. Got some heavy traffic to pass. Gary Rogers, Rogers in front of him. Gary running up in uh, fourth place, so he'll have suffered the indignity of being back just before the finish of this race. Rogers pulls out now. Trying to make sure that he's not going to get caught, but Moffat's got the inside line. They come across the strike, one lap remaining. Rogers decides he's going to sprint away and not get a lap put on him by Alan Moffat, if he can possibly do it. Coming up into Valvoline Corner, but he gives oh, him... No, he doesn't, he doesn't. Uh, I, Moffat, thought, I thought Alan Moffat was going to stay back and say, well, it doesn't matter whether I pass him or not, but he decided to pass him for a moment. I thought we were going to have the first and the fourth card tangled together. George Fury in the lead, but Roger saw him and got out of the way, and had he not, I think Alan would have been in strike there. What's that through there? They have had some problems coming down through 3DB, heading to Globally for the final time. Car number 43, the Mazda RX-7, the final corner coming out, checkered flag at the ready, round one of the National Touring Car Championship for 1983. First place today at Paul the Motor Raceway will go to Alan Moffat. Here he comes across to pick up the checkered flag. Second place will go to George Fury and third place to the veteran Murray Carter. And I guess the worst feature of all that is we really haven't got an indication of who's going to do what for the rest of the year. Well, while we think about it, let's take a break and return for the presentation and some more action at Melbourne International. This is the difference between the new Opus car cassette and ordinary cassettes. It's made of Lexan, a super tough polycarbonate that can handle extreme temperatures. Unlike ordinary cassettes, it won't melt, bend, buckle or warp when your car's sitting out in the blazing sun. It won't crack or shatter under even the worst pounding, won't distort inside your player and damage it, and keeps the high quality tape in perfect condition for thousands of miles of great sound. Win a Datsun, Toshiba Sound Gear, hundreds of prizes in the great Opus car Lucky Dip. Welcome back to Calder. Alan Moffat just pulling up at the uh, finishing line, about to go to the presentation area after winning round one of the National Touring Car title here today. Second place, of course, going to George Fury and third place to the veteran Murray Carter. Just behind him, one lap behind, and fourth place Gary Rogers, lapped at the very end of the race. And then Warren Cullen, another Commodore, is in fifth place. In sixth position, Stephen Harrington, the young, young Tasmanian driver. And in seventh place, and on the same lap, but one lap behind the, the leader, the second of the Nissan Bluebird drivers, uh, Freddie Gibson. An um, amazing uh, drive by Fred. He started off on the first lap. He was in 20th place, last car. 
and he got up in the finish while one lap behind to be in seventh position so that was a great result for him car number 11 is next which is Clyde Benson Brown who had one off but recovered well to come home in eighth place in ninth place car number 15 and if I could find who car number 15 was I could tell you it's the Mazda RX-7 of Ken Hastings of course he was passed us by Alan Moffat on the line he was on 47 laps but in ninth place and rounding off the top 10 car number 51 Laurie Nelson in a Ford Capri the best of the small cars and a good result by the Victorian driver not a good day though for the Holden deal with him looking at the transmission wondering what went wrong one thing is certain though the car is quick their driver is as fast as ever had a brake block up on the first corner went wide held it in masterful fashion got back in the race somewhere about 15th place had worked up to 10th at the end of the first lap but within another nine laps in other words at the end of the 10th lap Peter Brock was leading the race until the transmission gave out so a race full of a lot of question marks of what might happen in the future things that might have been let's not forget Alan Grice he was fastest in practice he led the race until something went wrong with the car so his form is very very fast he's as quick as anyone here and when Grice gets a car that survives he's going to be a winner Alan Moffat Mr. Showbiz walking up to the presentation area there he goes sprinting up to the presentation sprinting. area <laughs> look at that just starting to relax a bit now Gary Wilkinson waiting for him and it'll be interesting to hear just what Alan has to say when we go to the presentation area and uh, see the prizes presented for the first round of the Australian Touring Car Championship. Over to you, Gary Wilkinson. Ladies and gentlemen, to make the presentation following the first round of the 1983 National Touring Car Championship, I'd like to introduce the General Manager of Melbourne International Raceway, Calder Park, Mr. Bob Jane. Thank you very much. Alan, congratulations to you and Peter Stuyvesant on winning round one of the Australian Touring Car Championship. He's a nice trophy for you to remember it by, and my congratulations again. Uh, thanks to all the flag marshals and officials that stood out in the 40 degree heat. Uh, they've got my admiration and thanks. And uh, to Calder for staging uh, such a professional event, perhaps uh, next year we can start it a little later and we won't be in the heat. To Peter Stuyvesant and my great sponsors Mazda, thanks. And to the fellows, great car, a great finish. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to Alan Moffat and also to Mr. Uh, Bob Jane. And that just about concludes our telecast here from uh, Calder International Raceway today. It's uh, certainly been uh, a great telecast. We've seen a ton of action, not only in the uh, round of the Touring Car Championship, but of course uh, also in what was uh, round three of the FIA World Cup, the uh, International uh, Series. So let's uh, just briefly to recap those events, take you back to Evan Green and Mike Raymond. Thank you very much, Gary Wilkinson. A controversial finish to the World Cup race for Formula Mondial with the Canadian Alan Berg being declared the winner, but that being disputed by Charlie O'Brien, the leading Australian, because of the infringement at the start. We'll get some resolution of that over the next day or so. Thanks to Christopher Fraga for his assistance with the interviews with uh, drivers in the pits and to our special guest uh, commentator John Shepherd for his expert comments. Commiserations to those who didn't finish, those who finished the race with their tail up but their nose down and not moving. And we hope you'll be with us when we bring you motor racing next time, which will be the first Sunday in March at Amaru Park. That's right. Uh, tremendous program coming up at Amaru Park on uh, March the 5th. So for Sydney viewers and viewers all around Australia, make sure you join us on the Seven Network first in motorsport. We promise that to you throughout 1983. Mike Raymond, on behalf of Evan Green, we hope you've enjoyed the telecast this afternoon and we look forward to your company next time we go motor racing from either Amaru Park or from Calder Raceway.